Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Vance Bikes and Being Female. We're now in extended time because this series has been massively popular and that's thanks to you guys for tuning in and for all your comments and making it all engaging. So thank you so much for everyone who's been enjoying this and participating in it. We're going now into more and more specific and deeper topics. And today we're covering pregnancy and cycling. So we're back again onto a topic that is female specific because those blokes can't get pregnant. I had a conversation about that this morning. That is what makes it female specific. But obviously the guys are welcome as well if they know somebody who's pregnant or they ride with people who are pregnant or have gone through it. Please do join in because everybody is welcome. And we'd love to hear as well your comments and your questions. This is your opportunity to have those questions asked and answered. I've got some brilliant experts. So we'll try and get through as many of those questions as you can. And there's no such thing as a stupid question even if it is a stupid question this is your place to ask it don't worry about it don't 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 be shy uh, so let's get started introducing our guests today we're very excited about our first guest because what she's done um for herself she's also done for mums everywhere she's shining a spotlight on what is possible to be an athlete to be a working mum and to be a mum indeed in um in today's society and we're just so pleased to have her and to hear her experience. She won a silver medal at the 2012 Olympics road race and the world road race champion in 2015. So no small feat, really. And on top of that all, she's now got a child in tow, baby Orla. So Lizzie Dignan, we're welcoming you to Bants Bikes and Being Female today. Hello, everyone. Hiya, how are you doing? I just wondered, I've given a little bit of an introduction about you there, but if you could just introduce yourself to everybody watching, that would be great. Yeah, so hello, everyone. Uh, Lizzie Dignan, formerly Armitstead. Um, I started cycling when I was 15 years old and uh, turned professional when I was 18. So it all kind of got very serious very quickly for me and um, took a year off in 2017 to have my daughter, Orla. Um, no, that's wrong. Eight two. <laughs> Great <laughs> mum award. <laughs> yeah, so my daughter. Baby brain. Uh, yeah, still, still good. That excuse. Um, she was born in two thousand and eighteen, and since then I've been back to racing. So. Fantastic. Yeah, great. Well, we're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about your experiences later on. Uh, some of those are very unique to you, so you've got a quite a unique perspective. And some of it is going to be relatable to all mums everywhere. So, And we're also delighted because we're in good hands today. We've got some physios on board. Uh, so let's welcome Lucy, if you want to come on the screen now and just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Hi. Hi, Anna. Hi, Lizzie. Um, yeah, so I've, I've ridden bikes most of my life. Mainly, my main enjoyment is mountain biking recreationally, and I guess the thing that really drives me is just being in the mountains. And I've really enjoyed since having my son last year, Jasper, kind of uh, heading off to the mountains with him. We've been to New Zealand since he's been born, and he's managed to do that in the first year, so it's been great. Um, professionally, I'm, I work for the EIS, so English Institute of Sport with um, Olympic athletes in the innovation department. So I get to see the likes of Lizzie and other athletes come back to pretty major achievements um, after pregnancy but I don't think I really um, I, I didn't really realize what a big achievement it was until having a baby myself and realizing how tricky that return can be so I'm just personally on that journey back having just returned to work full time and managing Jasper at home and uh, yeah trying to get back on the bike particularly to techie things for me that um, maybe take a bit of confidence that goes after pregnancy so that's where where I'm at. Brilliant, thank you. And um, somebody that you know as well, something that you introduced me to. So thank you. We've got Charlie joining us today as well. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Hey, Charlie. Thanks for joining Hi. us. So go ahead. Just tell us tell us who you are and what you're contributing today. Yeah, um, I'm one half of Fit for Physio based in Sheffield. So professionally, I'm um, a physiotherapist and uh, working with people um, desperate to achieve their goals, whatever that may be. But in particular, my main passion is working with women and um, runners and cyclists mainly but it's working with them um, either through their um, pregnancy journey and um, helping them achieve their goals during pregnancy and beyond but most importantly um, empowering them to continue to exercise safely but also confidently uh, and personally i'm a recreational road cyclist as well um, but very much a runner turned cyclist um, and then running after two small boys myself as well so 
this is a welcome break. <laughs> full on, full on. Brilliant. And our final guest today has been here before. We've got Kaz Nicklin. Hello, everybody. Hey. Uh, hi. <laughs> My name's Kaz and I run Cycle Chic and we sell stylish cycling accessories, helmets and bags. And our mission really is to try and encourage more women to cycle, try and break down some of those barriers that prevent women from cycling um, and just, you know, get more ladies on bikes. Um, and I have two children. Uh, I have an two girls, an 11 year old and a two, nearly three year old. Um, and I cycled through my pregnancies and I'm a champion really of cycling whilst pregnant. I'm not a hardcore cyclist like Lizzie and perhaps some of the other people. I'm a bit of a poodler. I'm kind of to work, to the shops, to do the school run. But I actually found cycling really amazing for keeping my exercise up while I was pregnant and taking the weight off my knees and my hips. Cycling was easier than walking. So, uh, so yeah, so that's kind of me, really. Brilliant. And you know a lot about cycle clothing and you sell some sort of lovely, stylish clothing that doesn't really look like lycra like cycling kits on your website so cycle clothing is quite a niche thing maternity clothing is quite a niche thing is there anything out there that combines the two and we're going down like this funnel here which <laughs> just gets smaller that's a good question i don't know but what i would say is that maternity wear tends to be quite stretchy and I find that I often cycle in things that are quite stretchy. I'll often wear like a, you know, a, dre a, a dress, but that's really elasticated. So, and I have to say, when I when I was pregnant, I didn't buy much maternity clothes and I don't wear cycle specific clothes. I wear my own clothes. So I think actually the two can go hand in hand. If you have a nice kind of flexible dress to accommodate the bump, it's probably quite comfy to cycle in. Cool. It, actually, this is quite an interesting topic, clothing. This wasn't one that I was massively delving into. But thinking about it now, you know, like bib shorts and things like that, bib shorts over a bump. The one, So when we say bib shorts, we're talking the ones with the sort of like sleeves um, that come over your arms and things like that. Did any of you wear that sort of cycle specific clothing during pregnancy? So Lizzie, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I wore it every day because I trained... Well, I would say I exercised on the bike every day, pretty much until my daughter was born. But to be honest, it's one of those things, like even maternity clothing, I think you have to try it on. Like I bought so many things in the beginning that just didn't work. Like I think maternity clothing assumes that you're going to grow boobs as well as a bump, which I never did. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so yeah, I carried on wearing cycling kit, but I just wore a bigger size um than before and it was fine for me so okay and what anybody else yeah lucy oh i have to be honest i looked totally ridiculous by the end so i i rode till the day before i had jasper so i was 40 weeks and four days and uh i just looked like i had a massive beer belly and extra large shorts on and a top that wouldn't cover the bump but i think at that point i no longer cared <laughs> it was just about being out and 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 enjoying it um and the extra large shorts work pretty well but i think you're right there's definitely a niche area there for people to look more stylish than i did by the end of my pregnancy <laughs> it couldn't get more niche than that really maternity specific cycle specific clothing <laughs> for different weathers and different disciplines of bikes i think we're getting into like a small <laughs> Liz a little bit. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about role models because Lizzie, you are somebody who found yourself in a position of being a role model uh, for various reasons throughout your career. You know, first of all, just being an incredibly successful cyclist, and then for being an athlete and a mum. Uh, but what about when you were pregnant? Did you look around for role models of women who'd been in a similar position to you, and could you find any? Oh, I was constantly on Google. <laughs> Yeah. Or oh, just like hashtagging on Instagram, like athlete mom, just desperately searching for other women who had done it before me. And there are um, definitely more and more as well. But um, in terms of specific information about what those athletes were doing during their pregnancy, it was really hard to find because a lot of it's quite personal. Um, and you know especially if you're a first-time mum you don't even know yourself if what you're doing is right so I found um, the way I did it was I didn't want to 
share too much either because I didn't know if what I was doing was right or wrong or whatever and mm. um it was more just the inspiration of the women who'd done it like come back to their sport and proven that it was possible so obviously in cycling there was Sarah Story and Laura Kenny and um, and then, like, from an endurance perspective, I was looking at people like Paula Radcliffe, who ran the marathon six months postpartum and stuff like that. So I was, I was, yeah, I was on Google a lot. <laughs> and so when you were looking at them, and I guess a couple of those people would be friends as well, people that you could specifically talk to or actually talk to as opposed to just Googling them. But when you're looking at them, did you actually get tips and advice or did it just make you think, OK, they've done it so I can do it too, even if I don't know how? Uh, no, there was definitely areas of specific advice, like Sarah's story, breastfed both of her children, and that was something that I was really keen to be able to do with my daughter. Um, but just the technicality of being able to leave Orla and pump milk and all these things are just mind-boggling to a first-time mum. And um, she was brilliant at helping me with that because there's all these myths of, like, you have lactic acid and your breast milk and all these silly old lifestyles that just weren't true and I was really able to feel comfortable and, and confident about breastfeeding because of the advice that Sarah had. Excellent and Charlie you must come um, across some of these myths that Lizzie has mentioned there in your practice yeah. of what sort of things when we're talking specifically about mums that want to continue being athletes um, through during and after their pregnancy so what sort well, of things yeah. come up? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just being pregnant itself is confusing itself. There's so much conflicting information out there and you can Google anything, like like Lizzie says, and, and find what you want to hear or what you don't want to hear. So um, with exercising, it, it is good that there is some really good guidelines out there in terms of exercising during pregnancy. But yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of, like Lizzie was saying, um, like sports bras. Uh, I mean, Cas, there are very few sports bras out there that will allow you to breastfeed. <laughs> okay, so little things like that that the people will say, you know, how can I feed but also ride my bike? Little things like that. But, um, you know, right way through to the comfort of getting back onto a bike after you've had a baby, you know, little things like that that people will constantly be asking my personal and professional opinion about. And are there any, back on the clothing thing, are, are there any sports bras or kits? that have made, or that you have discovered, any of you, that have made um, post-birth easier for so breastfeeding and things like that. Anything that you can recommend to anybody who might be watching who's new in that experience? Charlie, have you come across anything? Two babies and still nothing, and I'm not having a third, so I'll leave that to one of the, someone else out there <laughs> to do the research. <laughs> I'll get on a mission and have a look for a sports bra that has a little flap, because that is a very good idea. Perfect, that's what you need, easy access. Yeah, I'm just going to put that extra support. <laughs> I'll put that one out to the audience as well. Any clothing that you've come across, like for cycling during pregnancy or afterwards, that have been a lifesaver to you, please do put them in the comments so that we can share them with other people. And I'd also like to hear from people about role models as well, like who they might have looked up to, other sporting mums that we could all get inspired by. I'd love to hear from you. And did any of you? Um, oh, what? What's that background noise there? It's somebody my playing phone going. I'm really sorry. It will, she will stop in a minute. <laughs> can you put the mute on? Can you put the mute on for a sec, Kaz? On your thing, that would be I fine. Um, uh, oh, there we go, Lucy. Yeah, you were going to say something there. I was just going to come in on the role models, Frank, because I think it's a really interesting. Yeah. Um, thing like for amateur cyclists like myself there's definitely people in professional sport I'd look to you know coming from Sheffield the Jessica Ennis Hills those kind of people who've come back after pregnancy who are amazing but I think also it was really important for me as an amateur cyclist to see people who were similar to me because sometimes elite people like Lizzie feel like superheroes if 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 you're not as good as them and, and uh, there was definitely it was important to have a network around me of people who made cycling okay during pregnancy and also reduced any judgment that pe well-meaning people might place on you for cycling for as long as you do through pregnancy. So I think that was a really, I think for people out there who are thinking about cycling in pregnancy to have supportive people around you who um, 
you know, other women that cycle through pregnancy do the type of cycling you do, that, that's super important, as well as looking up to the people who are right at the top of the tree in terms of competition and kind of give you confidence that it's okay for you. That topic of judgment is, I think, a really important one and one that I definitely wanted to spend some time on today um, because people have all sorts of different opinions and I can imagine... I don't know what sort did you would you ever come across comments where people were saying that you shouldn't be cycling or yeah go on Kaz yeah I mean I had I'm not an athlete obviously but I had loads of people saying to me are you sure you should be cycling you're pregnant you know a lot of kind of oh wagging fingers and disapproving looks and and it was like uh, this is why I feel like it's really important to get the message out that if you're if you're safe and you know you're you're a confident cyclist, and you and you're you're being sensible. There's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't cycle during pregnancy. And as I referred to before, I, your joints go a bit funny when you're pregnant, and you can get achy hips and achy knees. And I have to get to work carrying my laptop. And actually, that was really hard work walking when I was you know eight months pregnant. And cycling was great because it just took the weight off all my joints and. I think there is judgment and I think that's why some of these things need to be broken down that it's not you know it's not a dangerous thing to to cycle when pregnant just day to day. And Lizzie did you feel pressure you know you said that you didn't necessarily want to share too much of your pregnancy journey with people because do you feel like with that judgment mindset that you as someone who's quite in the public eye might might be open to criticism and judgment if you're saying I'm doing it like this were you very wary about what you put out or did you feel strongly that you did want to put out a certain message? Um, no, I think I was very aware just because of the women that have been around me that I've been around women that haven't had straightforward pregnancies. So I was never, uh, I've always, I was kind of risk averse as, as well. I understand that it's everybody's choice and it depends on your instincts, but I definitely didn't want to portray that it was kind of, that I was throwing caution to the wind and that it was, I was still really focused on being an athlete because I wasn't. My main focus was on my health and the baby's health. And as a professional athlete, I was doing way more than most women and I didn't have a nine to five job. My, my, I was still paid as a professional athlete while I was on maternity. So I was able to do two hours on the bike, but I spent the rest of the day on the sofa. And I didn't want people who were trying to hold down a job, trying to do two hours and then, you know, being totally flawed because it was exhausting. I was on my knees during pregnancy. I found it incredibly difficult and I didn't want to portray this, this to people who had, you know, normal lives, who didn't have the luxury of the recovery that I had and the nutrition and all those things. So I didn't want to put pressure on pregnant women to kind of do what I was doing because what I was doing was not realistic for a normal person who has two other children or whatever, you know. So I was just a bit wary of not putting pressure on other women, I suppose. That's a really good point because there's judgment from two sides. It could be like Kaz experiencing judgment, people saying that you shouldn't be cycling. But then I think you can also get pressure in places like social media when you see people that are being like super mums and achieving it all and just carrying on as if everything's normal. Um, when actually pregnancy, I imagine I've not, I mean, I'm talking here, but I've not been through it. So I really need to lean on you guys here. But, you know, it's exhausting and it's a personal experience for everybody. And what I quite like about this group and our expert panels today, you all know about cycling, you all know about pregnancy, but you've actually gone approached it different ways. And just like one by one, I'd like you to say how long you carried on cycling for during your pregnancy, because I think we've got quite a bit of a mix here. Um, so Lizzie, I don't think you've actually said, what, up, to, up to when did you uh, continue cycling and at what level? Uh, I rode all the way through. The first 12 weeks I did the least probably because I was very sick and um, just exhausted. Um, and I gradually went through phases, like the middle trimester I felt good again, did more. Last trimester you're just getting bigger. And tired again so um i rode up until three days before rollo was born um but yeah your choice yeah and what about you lucy 
Um, so I was really lucky and it, it's totally personal. I had a really lovely pregnancy. So I rode all the way through, but from about week 28, I was on an e-bike. I just found that pushing up the hills around Sheffield got a bit much for me. And there was a single incident that made me think, do you know what, like, let's stay safe here. And so the e-bike was the right option to take until, yeah, 40 weeks. And you're, you're quite into the off-roading side of things. Um, was there a risk aversion as well that you considered? Um, yeah, for sure. Like the trails I rode weren't the ones I'd go back and ride now. Um, and uh, I definitely rode in a very different way. And I had to be quite careful with that because when you start riding differently, probably it increases the risk if you try and be safe. Sometimes that's the worst thing you can do. Um, so I definitely rode different trails slightly differently, um, but really aware of, you know, not not overthinking things or riding too safe because that in itself being risky. Brilliant. And Charlie, what about you? Yeah, so I've got a completely different story to everyone else. So um, I'm a, very much a runner turned cyclist. So I didn't cycle through either of my pregnancies purely because I fell pregnant um, about a month after buying my first ever road bike back in 2015. So I didn't ride through either of my pregnancies. I ran through both of them up to about 35 weeks. Um, but um, I got I, probably, I could probably have a little bit more about returning to getting on the bike um, but certainly for me and that was very much because I didn't feel like I had the handling skills I didn't feel like I had the technical skills which um, I think you need I think if you can you've got that, the bike handling skills you much um, you lower your risk of obviously any injury and trauma which is where I think you know for, for Lucy Lizzie Kaz you know if you've got that confidence and that experience behind you then absolutely there's no reason to if you've got a straightforward pregnancy why you can't power on through that pregnancy cool and so i guess it's about listening to your body knowing your limits there that's a yeah, good, that's a good that, tip as absolutely well. you, you've got to adapt you've got to listen to your body throughout that that pregnancy and what about for those of you that did cycle through, did you make any adaptions to, we talked a little bit about clothing, but to your bikes, Lucy, you said that you started uh, riding an e-bike, which is a great solution. I think e-bikes are going to explode. I'm a huge, huge fan of them. There's so many different options for what they can introduce into cycling society. Um, what, what about, you know, having this big bump? Did that get in the way of your bike? Did you have, did anybody have to make any special amendments? Uh, start with your hands up and I'll, I'll go. Okay. Go on then, Kaz. Well, uh, it wasn't really an amendment so much, but actually it's kind of going back to your first question about everyone's different and every pregnancy is different because um, with my first daughter, I stopped much earlier. I stopped at about six months because I, I actually fell off my bike, but not I wasn't cycling. And this is the funny thing. I was my bike it changes your balance doesn't it and you sometimes you can sort of wobble or trip like you're drunk but you're not obviously um, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully yeah. your balance goes out of whack so with the first one I just it was almost an adjustment was making the adjustment to how I sort of get started or well, you know that kind of just as you get going and that's when I wobbled and fell off so I stopped cycling with that pregnancy but the second one I was a bit more confident. I had got that experience and I kind of had perfected those adjustments. So it wasn't so much adjusting the bike, but it was adjusting the way that I would mount, dismount, start, stop, really. And Lizzie, your your fleet of bikes, I imagine, will be designed for aerodynamics and top speeds and things like that. Could you carry on riding them? Uh, I did, yeah, yeah. I rode the, my race bike, my yeah track them on the right way through um i just put two spaces under the handlebars so i raised the handlebars towards the end yeah. oh great and you found it comfortable enough nothing was in the way did you did you have a big bump were you were you big um no i was pretty pretty petite yeah um mm. i had a bigger bum than a bigger bump i think <laughs> <by the end. laughs> and what about you lucy yeah, same as Lizzie. I put some spaces under my handlebars on all my bikes towards the end. And then the other key thing with the electric bike or all the bikes was the change in suspension, because obviously with the extra weight, it just needed to account 
like be a little bit softer for me um so that was that was pretty critical it would have been bumpy had i stayed at my uh, pre-baby <laughs> suspension setup <laughs> Uh, that's, yeah, it's a good point as well. And what about any other products or any other tips? So like talking physical things and like objects or adjustments you can make on your bike. I actually did see a question. I couldn't find it just before I came on here. I don't know where it was. Of somebody asking questions about saddles while pregnant because they were having an issue. Um, their, I guess their, probably their, their balance had changed or their weight distribution had changed and they were looking for a different saddle. So has anybody got any recommendations or things when they look back on that they would like to share with an audience uh, that are looking for this sort of advice? Lizzie? Uh, I, I actually didn't change my saddle at all. Um, I don't know why, probably in my pelvis I didn't change too much or whatever, but postpartum, my recommendation, like some people write that they're back on the bike in three weeks or whatever, but no chance for me. <laughs> I would give it the full six weeks and make sure that everything is healed and ready to go before you uh, risk that. Because if you damage anything there, then it takes so much longer to recover and it's just, it's a brutal time anyway. I just, my advice would be take the full six weeks off and hopefully the, the same saddle will still work. And is, is that something that you would see in your, your practice, Charlie? That maybe yeah. people might want to get on before the six weeks, but it's not to the best advantage? Oh, like even the most straightforward of labours, no no woman is ever gonna go, I really wanna get back on my bike straight away to sit on a hard object and go, that sounds like a really good idea. You know, people aren't gonna be rushing back just in general. So first of all, even if you've had a straightforward labour, you want to obviously consider um, the comfort of your saddle um, but if you've had anything that's been an assisted delivery a cesarean you know there's a lot of other complications in, in terms of your comfort but also further down the line thinking about um, I don't know how um, in detail you want to go here Literally. but the, <laughs> things like everything people, people, complications that people might not be aware of, something called a pelvic organ pro prolapse, the anatomy of your pelvic organs will change. And again, you're going to start putting pressure on different areas of the pelvis that you've never had pressure on before. So again, people start might, to, uh, might start to get bits rubbing that again weren't rubbing before. So definitely getting a saddle fit um, and getting a decent saddle postpartum is really important to your to your riding and your comfort and also your enjoyment. You want to enjoy this. So get a saddle that's going to allow you to have a, a good um, enjoy your riding again. So we're just so we're going down the road of um, post postpartum. <laughs> I don't even know all the terms, guys. <laughs> it's going to be embarrassing for me. But um, I just want to go back uh, one step because we're talking about when you're cycling and still pregnant. I think, Kaz, you're probably the best one to answer this because you're cycling around um, urban London. She's from Lauren and she said she'd love to be able to commute whilst pregnant. Was your sense of danger heightened when you were on the roads? It's a really good question. Yeah, and definitely. I mean, both cycling pregnant and then, you know, cycling after some recovery definitely but then with a little one on the back uh your sense of danger is really heightened and i you know didn't i, I wasn't cycling through central london so i was cycling west london i was very careful about my route and tried to keep it as off-road as possible through parks or quieter roads um so yeah i think it's a natural thing that your your sense of danger is heightened and you're you're protecting your little bump whether it's a little bump in front of you or a little one behind you in the back um but you know it's not impossible to cycle into central london it, again it, it all goes back to what you're comfortable with um and what you feel is the right choice for you cool and confidence as well i know um your hormones can be up and down during the crazy time of pregnancy was there any perceived i don't know where things felt like it was more impossible just because of your moods or did your mood affect your attitude towards cycling anybody or was it just was it like actually when you got out on the bike you'd get a, a happiness release or something go on lucy yeah, I think for me, getting back on a bike was about feeling myself and normal again and having a little bit of space and time that was really good for my mental health, being outside, um, back to the old Lucy. Um, yeah, but but what I was going to say on the hormone front, I think there were two things for me. One was sleep deprivation, massively impacted 
um, how I was riding and how I felt while I was riding. And the second thing was really, um, Charlie's touched on it and she could expand on it far better than I, but the ligament kind of, I could almost feel that my body wasn't held together in the same way as previously because of the breastfeeding. And so I felt quite nervous when I was on the bike um, after having Jasper around, particularly at, at times, like if I slipped, just my pelvis wouldn't be right. I'm sure Charlie can expand on that a bit more. So that was one of the biggest impacts for me in the early days getting back. And that actually lasted way longer than I expected it to. I'm still breastfeeding Jasper now and he's 14 months. But I think in the heavy days of breastfeeding the first six months, that had a, a major impact on me and my riding. Cool. Charlie, yeah, do you want to expand on that then? That's really interesting. Yeah, there's, there's two really key factors there that Lucy's picked up on. So first of all, when you're breastfeeding um you you have a relaxing hormone which is great when it's preparing you for labor because it allows the ligaments of the pelvis to obviously facilitate that birth but postnatally you have a massive you you have no estrogen in your body which again um again supports a lot of your ligaments so you've got to relax and you've got no estrogen so essentially all your joints are fairly relaxed okay so again particularly around the pelvis the knees the hips you haven't got that stability so you are very much at risk of injury which is why it's really important to work with um, a physio postnatally if you want to get a, a really strong core but also tiredness as well is a massive indicator in terms of your risk of injury so we know that a huge sort of from a holistic point of view rather than sort of a musculoskeletal physical point of view um sleep you need those eight hours which you, you've got no chance of getting that postnatally so if you're going to think about riding you need to have some sleep in the bank helps you again your injury risk is already fairly high and then we're going to have sleep deprivation to that, and then we're going to get back on a bike so again the ad, the odds aren't really stacking in our favor here so there's quite a lot of factors that we need to sort of address before we think about getting back on the bike and Lizzie, were you supported through that decision making? Because obviously getting back on a bike is not just something that you want to do, but it's actually something that you have to do because it's your career and you're contracted to do it. So were you given some support in that in that process? Uh, yeah, I was very lucky that with the team with Trek um, that I'd said that I wanted to be able to feed Orla for at least six months. Um, that was my, my goal. Um, and then I wanted to be able to return to racing nine months postpartum. I ended up actually returning seven months postpartum, um, but they were brilliant in terms of not um, making me go to training camps in the winter, trusting me to do it at home so that I could continue to feed all or et cetera. So it, it definitely, for me, in my situation, I needed an employer that was flexible and understood and trusted me to do my job and what about the, yeah and what about the sleep deprivation thing as well and uh, making sure that you get those in oh. i mean <laughs> that must be hard uh, i was um i was a crazy lady i think because <laughs> i i was so focused on my daughter getting enough sleep during the day i got obsessed with her nap times and her awake times and all these things and my mum and my sister were totally different to me in their approach to bringing up a little one and just really relaxed and i remember whenever i'd like let my mum look after her or my sister that i'd be like how long should we been awake for when was her last nap and i'd be straight on them because all of those naps add up to this good sleep and you know it worked we have a good sleeper and uh you know, it might have took a serious amount of like laps of car parks and getting the baby to sleep, but yeah, I needed to. I needed to for my job. I needed that sleep. So I was pretty intense with the whole nap schedule at the start. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wicked stuff. Um, and so Kaz, you're more into sort of cycling slowly. And um, did that make you then want to bring your child onto your bike quite early on because you know it wasn't a training thing it wasn't something you had to do I guess separate from your baby it was something that you could start incorporating little baby cycling life with yeah um, I mean like Lizzie was saying and Charlie I did take a long time to recover before I even wanted to go near a bike again just because of the sensitivity it just wasn't something I could do with both of them for a long time um but as soon as and also with getting a little one on the bike 
they need to, it, there are various different contraptions you can have, but to get them in a little seat, either on the front or on the back, they need to probably be around one to be able to sit up, to be able to sit up sort of straight when they won't kind of lollop over. Um, so, so yeah, I, I kind of have a, a little break from cycling with both, uh, but then what's been really sort of joyful and lovely is getting them on the bike eventually. Um, and my youngest one at the moment, I've got the same bike seat I have with my older one. We've just got it out again for the younger one. So it's done two kids and they've both really enjoyed being on the back of the bike. And it's such a good way to get them around, you know? I mean, I don't know other people's kids, maybe, I don't know. My my almost three-year-old just doesn't like going in buggies, just hates them. She just tries to climb out. But, and she's so slow walking. Um, putting her on the back of the bike is just a practical dream. And she's also just on the balance bike and she's a whiz. She's so fast. So it's kind of just great watching her do that. She's really mastered it. Like, ah! um, so yeah, so it's just lovely now enjoying that with her and, you know, kind of chasing after her basically is what I'm doing at the moment. So incorporating her into it. And what about you, Lucy, when you're, you're into mountain biking, would you use the mountain bike as an escape to have a little bit of me time, you know, time for yourself? when you're so in the throes of being a new mum? Or was it something that you really wanted to start sharing early on? Was it, was it say Jasper was your your boy's name? Was it something you want to start yeah. sharing with him? <laughs> no, um, in the early days, it was very much me time. And it, you know, I'd kind of grab an hour or whatever. It was very much the case of little and often because of trying to get back for feeds and, you know, to, to do the mum bit and then, um, as he's got older, as Kaz has alluded to, I think it's felt right to introduce him to bikes and to trailers and he's got his own little trike. But I suppose I've been really careful because I so badly want him to get into cycling, not to shove it in his face as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so certainly initially and still mountain biking's for me. It's my time. It's my thing that makes me me. But it's so lovely that it's something also that I can... I can do with him you know we've just bought a trailer and we can go along the trans pennine trail and that type of thing so i'm really really looking forward to the point at which he's kind of on some trail in the out going mum get off your brakes <laughs> <laughs> so you you've done it by using a trailer so that's what attaches to your saddle at the back and then has some wheels on and you've taken some off-road paths yeah, well, yeah. It's I mean, it's a two-wheel trailer, so you, you you kind of you you want to go on something that's fairly um what's the right word um not too techy, not too single tracky, because uh, the, if you've got anything too off camber, it will tip. So it's a fairly not basic trailer, but it's got some suspension with it, and it's just perfect for you know getting off road and doing some basic stuff as a family. You can get trailers that have a single wheel that are fairly expensive that we'll we'll do single track but we figured to start out with this was a good way to go and lizzie i remember speaking to you before that orla but having orla made you introduce a uh, sea cycling from a different point of view before it was just your job it was a thing that you had to do to get medals so i'd love to hear again your point of view about how that changed um i think i just realized that um, the ability to have my job that takes up, yeah, okay, four or five hours a day, and then I'm away for racing, but not a huge amount, meant that my work-life balance, I have a really good work-life balance. I may spend a lot of time with Orla, um, and I just felt really privileged and um, lucky to be able to be in a position where I get to do that, and I never thought that I'd be able to combine the two, and I think just my expectation of what being a mother would be like um, was different. I, I always assumed that when I became a mum, that would, what I just want to be a full-time mum, but actually that's not realistic. It's not who I am. I still need my own focus. So I really love my job because it's part of my identity. Um, and that kind of, the break, the maternity, everything just gave me this break to realize just how much I loved it and how much I love cycling. I think also the fact that my husband retired from professional cycling meant that I could see that from the perspective of a retired person, my sole focus wasn't just cycling anymore. I realized, you know, I'm, I've got the dream job <laughs> and then um, having the break during pregnancy allowed me to see that. And yeah, like I say, work-life balance and 
just being able to be out on my bike, it's part of who I am as well be, as being a mum. And being able to be on your bike with your child so you can combine that with being a mum, is that a totally different experience for you as well? Yeah, it's quite funny. Ola absolutely loves bikes because she sees me go out on it every day, I suppose, and sees her dad on his bike a lot. And she's just fascinated by them and loves to be either on the front or on the back. She prefers to be on the front. We have two seats, so she's she's spoiled already. Yeah. <laughs> so there's different seat types. We've just had a link at the bottom there. So for anyone watching this, we've covered front seats, which I go on sort of just on the top tube and the handlebars, like the let go of the handlebars, I think. Um, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong in a, in a sec. Uh, back seats and also trailers. And um, you can also get cargo bikes where you have like a sort of wheelbarrow type thing at the front of your bike. Um, so, Kaz, what do you use? Um, I'm just seeing if you can see. I did bring my child's seat yeah, here. Yeah, I think the just got the best. Sort of seat. Yeah, so, yeah, got that. So that's what I use at the moment. But I have similarly used a front seat as well. And a front seat is lovely when they're quite little, when they're first starting, because they're in a really nice position between your arms and they feel quite secure because, you know, you're kind of almost hugging them, really. Because um, having them at the back is a bit different. You're kind of like, oh, are you OK? You only have to keep checking on them. Uh, so I think front for the, the front for when they're first starting is great. And then you can move them to the back. And my elder daughter went on the back on this very seat, actually, until she was six. So it can last them for quite a long time until they're, you know, hopefully away on their own bike by then. Um, but cargo bikes are great. I mean, obviously, they're a big investment. They're not cheap. They're sort of definitely over a thousand, probably more than that, between one and three thousand, probably. But, you know, they're, they're, from, they're very popular in um, Scandinavia where people cycle a lot more. And, and the bonus is you can get a couple of kids in. You can get shopping in. You know, it's just like the practicality of a car, but you're on a bike. So I think hopefully like electric bikes, they'll start to become more commonplace as we move hopefully to a green transport system. Yeah, as so long as you don't live near too many mountains. I can't imagine getting two kids and all your shopping up the hill in a cargo yeah. bike. Unless you get an e-cargo bike. E-cargo bike, that's what you need, yeah. <laughs> We're really discovering some niche concepts here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to get some investors. Um, so I just want to say again to the audience, if anybody's got any questions, please do pop them in the, question, in the comment bar. We'll, we'll try and answer them as we go along. We've had one here from Nicola. Who, and also who's repeating a question from Jane, and it's about her max heart rate in pregnancy. Um, so Nicola, no, it hasn't really been addressed yet, and I would suggest this is probably one for Charlie. Um, I'm just gonna see if I can find the original question from Jane. Yeah, it says, I've been trying to research recommended heart rates when cycling. I have a naturally high heart rate as soon as I start moving and a naturally low resting heart rate. I've seen some information about not letting your heart rate go over 75% during pregnancy. Is that really necessary? Any comments would be great. So maybe we'll start with you, Charlie, but anybody else who'd like to have an input on this would be welcome. Thank, yeah, thanks, Jane. I don't I don't need specific heart rates, but definitely you want to be working in an aerobic threshold. So um, I would definitely lower your intensity. You want to basically, the, 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 the guidelines really are more about your rate of perceived exertion. So you want to be working at approximately seven out of ten if she's familiar with that scale so it's the ability to still hold a conversation in broken um, broken sentences that's the maximum you want to be working at so if she wanted to, an, an objective guideline in terms of how much or how hard she should be working that would be my recommendation so about um, it's called the rate of perceived exertion so working at approximately seven out of ten so making sure if she's Holding a conversation, she can still hold that within broken sentences would be my recommendation in terms of intensity. Cool. Has anybody else got anything they particularly want to add to that one? Yeah, Lizzie? Um, I would just say also be aware of the fact that temperature is really important, especially at the moment with these kind of freak heat waves in the UK. Um, I, I was living in France at the time of my pregnancy and there were times where I just couldn't go outside because it was too hot. Um, and that's something that you need to be very careful of, overheating. Um, and, 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 I, and I understand where she's coming from in terms of all the confusion about heart rates and stuff, but um, it is just about your own instinct, I think, um, and 
I would err on the side of caution just because it's there's so much I think when you're pregnant you're so fearful of all this fitness you're going to lose and you're never going to get back to it and all these things but it's just a snapshot of time and your fitness comes back so quickly I know obviously I'm a professional athlete and I was working hard at it but for mother mums I've spoken to too just you're you're so strong after you've given birth and you're running around after a newborn baby like just I would yeah just enjoy the moment for what it is because there'll be plenty of time to be reaching those heart, top heart rates afterwards I think. I love that I think that's that is really good um it's really heartening advice you know you can focus on on the mum side of things it doesn't mean that anything uh, the fitness or other sides of your life will be gone forever it's something you can come back to so yeah Lucy. Yeah, just to back up what Lizzie said, really, I, I found fitness came back much, much quicker than I thought it would. I was really fearful going to an e-bike at 28 weeks, that that was it for me. For the rest of my life, I was going to be, you know, relative couch potato compared to before, and it just wasn't the case. It came back really quickly. And the other thing I'd say is very, very much go with how you feel. So I found that what I could do varied so much during the pregnancy and being dialed into kind of how you're feeling and that rate of perceived exertion that Charlie's talked about is pretty critical for knowing when to say, okay, I did this ride last week, but this week, do you know what? I feel terrible doing it or I can feel my heart rate's really high. I can't talk at the hill. Just, just, you know, just go home on that occasion and you, you, you will find the next week it's a totally different story, but I guess your body's just undergoing so much change at a relatively quick rate that um, you just have to be quite sensitive to it would be my main advice. Cool. All right. Well, I think we can start wrapping it up there, really. Um, if anybody here has got any other comments they'd like to add, we're going to go. Around, there's nothing like being put on the spot, is there? But we're going to go around to each one of you individually um, and ask you just to share something about cycling and pregnancy, whether it's a piece of advice that you got given that you'd love to share or just a, a funny story or a heartening story or a topic that we've not covered um, that you would like to get mentioned. So. Um, Kaz, have you got anything off the top of your head? Um, just that I I think it's totally up to the individual. I think that was really interesting. We've all got quite different stories. Um, but something that I've found with my second pregnancy was that I did cycle right up until the day before I went into labour. And um, I think there's something that happens. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, that you almost decide when you're Get ready to go into labour and I've had this actually I've had this with both pregnancies I've had something I had to get finished and get done and they've been related to my business so they've been related to cycling I've had to do like a certain thing that I've had to finish and with both both times I've like yes I've finished that job I've done it and I went into labour the next day I don't know if that's a cycling anecdote or what, but it's something about being mentally prepared but no, I think my point is that actually keeping active and keeping busy can help you kind of get to labour on time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's wild. Right, um, we're going to come back to these little stories in a sec, but we've got a question here that I'd like uh, to get, get the opportunity to have answered. Uh, Judith has said that she's recently bought a tag along for her four year old and she's nervous about road cycling. She's not cycled for a number of years. So, can you recommend the best way they can both enjoy cycling together? Um, who wants to answer that one? I'd say, well, I think, um, Kaz, you've got some really interesting stories, and Lucy, yours is like very different, more like countryside versus urban. So, Lucy, do you want to talk about how they could maybe enjoy cycling together with her four year old? I mean, yours is still younger than that, but you're getting started. Yeah, so I guess, that, I mean, there's some really good um trail networks, certainly around the Sheffield area, that's really simple riding trans pennine trail monsel trail that kind of thing which is obviously car free you've got good visibility of pedestrians and horses and all the rest of it and we've certainly found that a really good safe place to go because you definitely want that feeling of of safeness when you when you're with a small child so i think finding the right location is critical as a starting point and those types of places offer it Cool. And from an urban point of view, Kaz, have you got anything to add to that? 
I, yeah, I think it's just about finding a space that you feel comfortable with. And, you know, there's so many lovely paths through parks where you haven't got that worry about traffic. Um, so it's just maybe just doing a little bit of planning of what's the route that feels really comfortable um, that, yeah, you're not you're not going to feel nervous because you don't want to feel nervous if you're, got, you've got a little one on the tag along on the back. You want to feel kind of you're in a safe space. Great. Thank you. All right. So we'll continue wrapping this up uh, with those stories or comments or anecdotes, anything that you personally want to say, really. Uh, Charlie, over to you. Oh, thanks, Anna. Um, definitely one of the first things I do with anyone in the clinic, um, pre or postnatally, is before I even look at them, before I do anything, I want to know what makes them tick. So does their riding control them or do they control their riding? So for most people, I just get them to ditch their ego. So straight away, whatever they've done before, you just get rid of that. OK, for a lot of people, it's about focusing on health and well-being, particularly during their pregnancy. And then we can start to look at performance. But for a lot of people, just focus on health and well-being and just enjoy it um, and try not to focus on that prenatal version of themselves because they will never be the same after having a baby. They may even be better and stronger. OK, but definitely there's no there's no mileage in comparing themselves to what they used to do. OK, so that's a really unhealthy emotion. So ditch the ego and just have fun. I love that. I love that. I reckon I could end up falling into that camp. So I'm so glad that uh, you said that, actually. Yeah, Lucy? Yeah, I'm going to build on Charlie's point. I definitely fell into that camp and it was actually, um, I had a cesarean section and I think I expected myself at four weeks to get up and just continue yeah. life with a new baby. And so I, it made a huge difference for me going into Charlie and talking to her. And I remember that first session vividly going in, having had no sleep. And I think I'd just been out for a quite a long bike ride I just thought all right, I'm just going to get up and do it which probably wasn't the best thing to do in retrospect and having someone who almost gave you permission to just go stop it's fine <laughs> after pregnancy to give yourself a little time to recover and to not have the expectations of yourself that you had pre-pregnancy now you've got this little one so uh, yeah that would be my main reflection <laughs> great and finally Lizzie is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience today uh, just, I think, try to avoid comparisons, like postpartum, prepartum, um, everything, every pregnancy is different, every baby's different. Uh, you know, I was lucky that all of, you know, fed well and slept relatively well, etc. So it meant that I was able to get out on the bike and I know other mothers, you know, a friend of mine at the baby club, her son had colic and she was just in pieces and no chance was going on a bike or getting back to exercise her priority but i think everything just feels quite overwhelming and emotional when you're pregnant or when you've just had a baby and it's just remembering that it's temporary um and it gets so much easier is my advice brilliant cool um just gonna kind of wrap it up there but actually we had one more sneaky question in saying did you find the healthcare sector supportive neutral or skeptical so I guess about you know continuing to cycle whilst pregnant. What is there an official line that seems to come from the NHS or the healthcare? Yeah. That, Do you yeah. want me? Oh. Yes, please, Charlie. Okay. Go for it. Basically, if you're a cyclist, don't Google "Can I cycle during my pregnancy?" NCT or NHS because they will say no. Okay, so. Don't do that. Um, but if you do look at the chief medical officer's advice for um, exercise during pregnancy, actually, it's very supportive um, of moderate intensity exercise during pregnancy. And in fact, he encourages it. It basically lists a huge amount of benefits for cycling during pregnancy or for exercising during pregnancy. But I would just check with your GP and your midwife just because cycling does fall into that high risk category. So definitely check if you've got a normal, healthy pregnancy, check with your GP and your midwife. But there's no reason why you couldn't continue to cycle during pregnancy if you're already cycling. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out today. It's been fascinating. And uh, hopefully, you never know, um, I'll have picked up some tips for the future as well. And anybody who's asked some questions, just want to let you know that in the audience, loads of people have been answering each other's questions in the audience chats as well. So um, just make sure that you check out those comments there. Thank you to our guests, Kaz, Lizzie, Lucy and Charlie. Really appreciated your time today. This has been put on by Charity Cycling UK to 
get information out to women who are starting cycling, bridge that gender gap in cycling because it's unnecessary. And if you want to get more tips and information, you can join the Cycling UK Women's Newsletter. So we'll put the link for that in the comments. And uh, just to let you know as well, it's a Women's Festival of Cycling coming up in a couple of weeks' time. So stay tuned on the Women's Cycling Cycling UK page. Until next week, uh, we're going to be talking about cycling and menopause. So go and go in the other end of the spectrum next week. We'll see you and some new guests then. And to our guests for today, thank you. See you later. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.